Thank you, John, for hosting this uh, talk today. Thank you all for being here, even on Saturday. And thanks for the organizers for doing a marvelous job in uh, making this conference online. It's really great. So today I will talk to you about precognition uh, and about the question uh, about knowledge from the future or footprints from the past. Um, our everyday perceptual experience suggests that we see the world exactly as it is. However, this nice picture from uh, my work group already demonstrates you that uh, how we see the world is constructed by our perceptual system. And the current view is that our percepts result from probability calculations. And in a simplified model, the perceptual outcome is uh, constructed by exogenous sensory information from vision, from audition, from tactile or olfactory uh, modalities. And this is weighted with endogenous information. And endogenous information means memorized perceptual experiences from different time scales, contextual relations based on previous experiences, and so on. Most importantly, uh, it seems that time plays a role for our construct, constructs, endogenous constructs of reality. And um, as I said, uh, our past experience has strong influence how we see the world at the current moment. I will label this perceptual history effect. However, precognition uh, assumes that also information from the future may have an influence on how we see the world at the present moment. Um, we will use uh, ambiguous figures or uh, more specifically here, the famous Necker cube in order to study this. And the Necker cube, most of you may see it like this. Others may see it like this. It's a, the most prominent and biggest figure. And the interesting bit is while you observe the Necker cube, your perception changes every now and then between this orientation and that orientation, even though the sensory information stays unchanged over time. Um, so why should we use ambiguous figures to study precognition? So ambiguous figures are fascinating in itself and they occur in most psychology and neuroscience textbooks, typically in the chapter about consciousness. They are used in time perception research. They are even discussed in the context of insight process and they are popular example stimuli for models in the context of generalized quantum theory by Harald Atmansbacher and colleagues. And it has been proposed that unstable mental states are more prone to anomalous correlations. And we use unstable perceptual states as a subclass of unstable mental states. And they have the advantage that they can be easily induced in the lab. So uh, Dick Biermann was the first who did uh, a precognition study using the Necker cube. In 2011, he published his paper. And the, his idea was that participants had to uh, observe the Necker cube. And they have to indicate by key press when they perceive a sudden reversal in orientation. After key press, Biermann presented a disambiguated version of the cube, either this or that. And he was interested in the question whether the duration of the stable percept perceiving the Necker cube can be influenced by what is coming afterwards, either this or that. And particularly, he looked whether the perception of this one uh, was shorter or longer if this one comes or if this one comes in the future. He 
uh, reported significant effects in three separate studies. And what he essentially did is he repeated uh, this initial trial many, many times, 32 trials on average. And his idea was that the future stimuli uh, influence how long we have a stable percept of the necker key. The problem, one of the problems with this, with these studies is that since there were so many trials in succession, it could have also be the case that not the future influenced the perceptual duration of the Necker cube, but the history, namely the previous disambiguated cubes could also have an influence on the Necker cube. This was not controlled in Biermann's study. So we did also experiments with uh, Necker cube stimuli and we tried to control for the perceptual history. And this is what I want to show you. Instead of the Necker cube being used, the Necker lattice, it looks a little bit like an Ikea shelf. And these are the two disambiguated versions of it. And as I said, we controlled both past and future while analyzing the present. We had two separate conditions. Let's start with condition AD. And in this condition, we presented these lattices in pairs, S1 followed by S2. And participants had to observe S1 and indicate in which orientation they perceived the ambiguous stimulus S1. And then uh, there was a disambiguated stimulus S2, and they had to report whether this disambiguated S2 was perceived in a different spatial orientation compared to S1. This has been done, the study has been done by Ellen Joos, my former PhD student, thanks to Ellen. And uh, as in Biermann's study, we repeated uh, such an observation sequence as we called it many, many times, up to between 100 and 200 times, which took between five and 10 minutes. And as I said, we, we looked for the past and the future in influencing what is perceived in the present. And do, in doing this, we can distinguish four different scenarios. And in one scenario, the past and the future lattice stimulus had the same orientation, namely front side to the bottom right, or B. Here, the past and the future stimulus looked uh, front side to the top left, or T. And in the two other uh, scenarios, one looked to the bottom right and the other to the top left, and vice versa. So we can separate these four scenarios and analyze them separately in principle. So let's look first for history effects. In order to study history effects, we only concentrated uh, in the first step on these two scenarios. And the, the, the fact is in these two scenarios, or the important thing is that the future is always the same. However, the past differs and we were interested in how this scenario has an influence on perception of the present. How we did this, we calculated in principle, so we, we presented a disambiguated lattice, an ambiguous lattice, and again a disambiguated lattice. And uh, this sequence could be perceived either like this or like this. And what we did is we calculated the probability of seeing the sequence like this. And how we did this, we simply counted the number of these reports and divided it by the sum of these reports and these reports, which is essentially the probability of perceiving this like that. Okay, then we can also have this scenario where the past is different, but uh, the present and the future are the same. It would be like this, this scenario. And in principle, we calculated the probability of this in the same way as we calculated the probability of this. And then we had the idea, if the past has no influence on perception of the present, uh, this difference should be zero. 
We call this the, perception, the probability of a history effect given that the future uh, lattice stimulus looks to the uh, bottom right. So uh, our, our H0 hypothesis is that there is no difference between this and that, and therefore the difference is zero. And H1 is that this difference is unequal to zero. Okay, let's look at the results. On here on the x-axis, you have the different scenarios and on the y-axis, you have these uh, difference of probability values. And it's easy to read. You simply have to look here is the zero line and any systematic deviation from zero is an effect. Each filled circle is one participant and the open circle is the, the, uh, the mean plus minus a standard error. And as you see, we have a considerable history, which means the perceptual history here has an influence how we, in how we see the ambiguous lattice at the present moment. Okay, so we looked at these two and compared them with each other, but we can also look at these two and compare them with each other. Here is simply the future is now different, but consistent between scenarios and again, the past is different. And let's see what we find here. Again, a significant uh, history effect. Now we can apply the same logic and analyze the influence from the future, namely precognition effects. And in order to do so, we simply kept the past stimuli uh, identical, but looked only at those scenarios where the future is different. And we looked whether a different future has an influence on how we see the present. We applied the same calculation logic with the same H0 and H1. And this is the result. No significant effect. Okay, here we kept the past the same with the uh, uh, front side looking to the bottom right. We can also look uh, at, this, at these scenarios where the front side looks to the top left. And again, we found no effect. Okay, so um, I talked to you that uh, we had two separate conditions. First, we looked at condition AD. Now we look at, at condition DA. In the condition AD, stimulus one was ambiguous, stimulus two was unambiguous. In condition D, Stimulus one was unambiguous and stimulus two was ambiguous. Here we analyzed this sequence. Here we analyze now that sequence. It's completely irrelevant why we did this. And also the details are irrelevant for the moment. The relevant thing will be clear in a minute. We applied the same logic of analysis and here are history effects. And as you see in this, DA condition, the history effect seemed to disappear compared to this. And this was also indicated as significant in our ANOVA. And again, we found no precognition effects in the second condition. So now let's have a closer look at the precognition data. Here we had a uh, scaling from minus 0.8 to plus 0.8. Let's change the scaling from minus 0.2 to plus 0.2 and only look at the precognition data. And then you see it like this. And then we, we defined thresholds. So this is one standard deviation, this line and that line. And this is two standard deviations, this line and that line. And what we did here is we simply looked at individual participants that deviated these arbitrarily chosen thresholds. And uh, since uh, we have from each participant, we have data for each of these four scenarios, we can identify the identical participants here by color and shape of the icons. And as you see, there is one participant who deviated two standard deviations, but only in this scenario. However, we had also another participant who deviated at least 1.5 standard deviations in two scenarios. 
we regard this as interesting. So let's make an intermediate summary. So the immediate perceptual history has a strong influence on the current percept. This is what we've shown here with the red data. No significant recognition-like effects at a group level, as you see with the blue dots. However, an interesting pattern at the individual level, as you see here with this participant. Okay, let's jump to experiment two. I demonstrated you now that it is important also to look into the history, into the past, not only into the future. The question is whether there is a kind of interaction between influence from the future and influence from the past. And keeping this in mind, it may be interesting to look at precognition effects if we don't have any past. So if we only have a future, but not a past, we try to look at this in our second experiment. And just a reminder, this is again, the design of the first experiment with 100 to 200 observation sequences in a, in a row, so to speak. In the second experiment, which has been done by Kriti Batya, my former master student, we, we had uh, this letter ex lattice experiment, but we, we intervened another experiment, an unrelated experiment where we used smileys. I don't report about this experiment. I only want to make clear that the block durations here were much, much shorter compared to our first experiment. We only showed three observation sequences and the observation sequences had the same logic as in the previous experiment. And the idea was that the first observation sequence with the first pair of stimuli should be free of an immediate history, given the idea that the unrelated experiment extinguishes any short-term memory of the previous lattice block. And with pair two, we have only one example in, in our short-term memory. And with pair three, we have two samples. So we can now look at pair one, pair two, pair three separately. We analyze them separately and look whether we find different patterns in these three observation sequences with these three pairs of stimuli. Okay, let's first look at uh, influence from the past and as I explained to you before, it makes no sense to analyze pair one because pair one has no past, no lattice past, at least no immediate lattice past. So we analyzed only pair two and pair three. And as you see, we have again a strong history effect. However, interestingly, in an opposite direction. In the graphs before, the effect was downwards, here it's upwards. And in the second pair, the history effect again gets weaker, interestingly. Okay, now let's look at the precognition effects. And the most interesting part, as I mentioned before, is pair one, because pair one has a future, but now no immediate history. And as you see, there is no effect, no precognition effect. Also no precognition effect for pair two and no precognition effect for pair three at the group level. Now we can again apply the logic from before. We can have uh, these thresholds, 1.5 standard deviations, two standard deviations. We can identify identical participants by colors and shapes. And then we see there is one participant who uh, shows a deviation who is uh, more than 1.5 standard deviations away from the mean in the second observation sequence, but also in the third observation sequence. We also have another one here, which is even beyond two standard deviations in observation sequence one and two, and we have another one. So we have three participants who consistently show uh, beyond our threshold data. Okay. So if we ignore now uh, the focus on the individual participants and look at the global pattern of these data, we can observe another interesting thing. Namely, if you 
compare the three observation sequences with each other, you may notice that the variability between participants in observation sequence one is much smaller than in observation sequence two and observation sequence three, which is significant. So let's discuss these results. So first of all, we found relatively strong but opposite group level history effects in experiment one and two. Explanations for this, particularly for the opposite effect direction, are available in the literature. They are not so relevant here. I wouldn't speak about them now. We found overall no group level precognition effects, but interesting patterns on the individual level. We further found a kind of interaction between the perceptual future, precognition, and perceptual history, looking at the variability of the data. So let's discuss this. Um, one question would be, should we focus on the precognition gifted individuals rather than looking for group effects? I know this has been discussed uh, many, many times. However, at least the present data may support this. Then the second question is, can participants be in precognition states over a short period of time? I mean, in experiment two, the uh, observation sequence two and observation sequence three are separated by in the range of seconds. In experiment one, Condition AD and condition DA are separated in the range of minutes. And there is at least one participant who produced at least some uh, considerable effects. So maybe participants, individual participants can be in precognition states over a short period of time. Then how we can interpret the interaction effects. And there is uh, an interesting paper by Harald Abmansbacher and Thomas Filk, who proposed uh, a test for temporal non-locality in bistable perception. And this may be an interesting direction to think about these interaction effects. So maybe there is a short time period where it is difficult to define past, present, and future. And they provided uh, an idea about testing this. And I have at the moment no idea how to bring together this experiment with their idea, but it is at least interesting to think in this direction. And finally, at the end of my talk, I want to emphasize that future precognition experiments need to take the perceptual history into account. And I hope I convinced you uh, for this by showing my data. Thank you all for your kind of attention and now I'm open for questions. Thank you, Jorgen. Uh, if anyone has questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat and I'll be happy to try to see if we can work with those a bit. Um, Jorgen, I, I noticed you said that there was uh, a like 200 trials for a session? Yeah. Uh, have you considered the fatigue effect that this might have on the participants? Yeah, of course, this is, this is an important point. And uh, I showed you in, your sec in my second experiment that, that I, uh, I intermingled a second experiment. And, and I, I do this all the time. Uh, so I, I typically, my experimental blocks are no longer than five to seven minutes. And then there is a short break and then something else comes to keep their, the attention of the participants vivid and to, to have also some short period of relaxation and closing their eyes and things like that, you know? So I take this into account, but you can't avoid it completely. That's right. And I mean, some people make experiments three or four hours and I, I wouldn't believe in any of their data. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard this really, EG experiments. Some colleague told me, uh, 
it, it takes us half an hour to prepare all the electrodes. And if we spend so much energy in, in making this, we want to have at least four hours measurements. <laughs> this happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy you're considering the participants in the process. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> so, you know, so much emphasis was based on the Bierman study, the original study. Is the original data available and can you reanalyze it related to historical effects as well? To be honest, I didn't check this. <laughs> I didn't check this. I mean, yeah, this, this is a brilliant idea, by the way. One should contact Dick Bierman and ask for the data. That's right. Yes, that, we have some brilliant people asking questions in here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, the the task seems to be pretty mundane. It's uh, it's it's not very emotionally engaging or That's attractive right. to people. Have That's you considered that maybe more emotional or engaging tasks might have a different effect? I haven't considered this uh, at the moment. I. I I'm inspired by these ambiguous figures because, you know, uh, I believe that it's really a good idea to put participants in an unstable perceptual state. And there is a whole theory behind this uh, that people, if, if they are in an A categorical, I mean, I, I presented this one slide, you know, so ambiguous figures are discussed as a model for insight process. So. I mean, in principle, our perceptual system works in a categorical manner, you know? So we, we essentially in, in, every, in, in normal situations, we see what we know or we perceive what we know, even though sometimes uh, the sensory information can be very new to us. This, this can be experienced by, by all of us. If we look into the clouds, it's easy for us to see faces or if we look at the formation of stones, you know, so we are so categorical in a sense that we, we in everything which is unknown to us, we see familiar things, you know, and, and the, these ambiguous figures, they allow us to drive the system in, into a state of maximal instability, where perception alternates every now and then uh, forth and back. And, and I always thought that such an unstable perceptual state can be a very interesting state, you know? And this is why I'm so prone to, to these ambiguous figures, you know? <laughs> yes, and I can see how from an from a experimental viewpoint, it definitely provides an interesting perspective, but from a, a participant's viewpoint, it may not be so engaging. <laughs> Yeah, on the other hand, you know, I also had participants who, who did our experiments. I, I work with ambiguous figures for many years. And, and some people come to us and, and ask us, how did you do this? I mean, th this changing my percept. I spend a lot of energy to, to find any tiny hint that makes me seeing it like this or like that. And then if we tell them, we did nothing. All of this happens in you. They couldn't believe, you know. <laughs> what about using a variety of ambiguous figures in a single session? Yeah, um, this is also a, a good idea. However, it's, it's not so easy. If you, I mean, what is also familiar stimulus is this old young woman. You may be familiar with it. Some people see an old woman, some people. Uh, the, the, these types of ambiguous figures are typically labeled as semantic ambiguous figures, you know? And you have much more control over them, yeah? So some people can, can they can decide by themselves, okay, now I want to see the old one, now I want to see the young one. And we had participants in the lab, which we had to send home because they were even unable to have a stable percept over a, a short period of time because it flipped very quickly, uh, a fourth and back. And, and uh, th th this neck cube, these more geometric and biggest figures, which are more low level, so to speak, 
you, you don't have that much volitional control, which has also its benefits, you know. <laughs> so there were questions about um, the number of exceptional performers you had. Yeah. Is it, uh, it, did you notice that it was larger than what you can expect in the general population? For example, if you're evaluating at 0.05 level, you would expect that 5% would be exceptional performers yeah, of, by of chance. Of course, of course. Uh, I mean, th this is difficult to say. I mean, I, I, purposefully, I, I presented the history effects and the recognition effects in one slide, just to see that, that the, the order of magnitude is much smaller for the recognition data. So I think looking only at one scenario, I would say there is nothing to write home about, you know. <laughs> However, only and and I hope I, I made the point only if if you find this consistently across scenarios or across time, then it becomes interesting, I would say, mm -hmm. right? Because this shouldn't be expected, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the the second experiment that you did. Uh, you had a cleansing process mm -hmm. to cle essentially cleanse their sensory perceptions. Yeah. Did you test to see if that actually worked? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the, there is a lot of literature out about adapting ambiguous figures. So you, you, you present an unambiguous figure and then you present an ambiguous figure and by the identity of the unambiguous figure before you can reliably predict how they see the ambiguous figure, you know? So this is, you, you can have adaptation effects that they see the opposite, or you can also have priming effects that you see the ambiguous figure in the same direction. And this is a question of time, how long you presented the unambiguous version. And this is quite clear. So I, I completely knew how long I had to take off the ambiguous figure in order to, to extinguish short-term memory. So there is a, a lot of literature outside that told me w what time to use, you know? So, so you didn't validate it, but the previous literature provided a guidance. I, I, I didn't validate it in this study, but I validated it in a former study. So I, I also had hands on this adaptation and priming things. And I knew from own analysis that the data reported in the literature are valid. Right. So, um, and, and I'm not familiar with this, but in the 1980s, Rupert Sheldrake did a foreground background experiment worldwide. <laughs> and how do your findings correlate with this? Oh. I think I, I didn't read it. <laughs> so it would be nice to, to get the, the person who, who asked this question to send me the reference. I would be really curious to look inside. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm not familiar with that specific study myself, or I'd go into more detail. But maybe yeah. during, the, during the break, um, you can have more discussion about this. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm sure you are familiar with Daryl Bem's work related to precognition. Yeah, and yeah. pre-sentiment as well. Yeah. I was wondering, can you imagine a similar model applied to some of his yeah. experimental yeah. studies? Uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that someone asked for, for uh, Daryl I mean, uh, Daryl Ben did a seminal study, you know, and uh, it, it's not so easy to apply uh, the, the, the arguments I presented today for the biggest figures to Daryl Bem's experiment, right? It's not so easy, but this does not mean it's impossible. I, I would say the following. We, we should consider that some perceptual experiences, and, and this is why I chose the title, leave deeper footprints in our memory than others. And, and I think we have to consider this, yeah? I think that, I mean, let, let me go one step back. The point is that, um, I mean, I come from, from perceptual research. And the point is that the information available by our sensory systems is much worse 
than all of you could imagine. So there is a huge need for construction, you know? And, and what our perceptual system does essentially is it takes, as I said, it, it takes what it, know, what it knows. So it makes uh, predictions from what has been experienced immediately before. The, the, the example with the clouds and the faces inside and things like that. And so we, we exploit these footprints from the past in order to anticipate the future. I mean, from an evolutional point of view, those creatures that were as quickly as possible with a good model of this bad sensory information would have survived you know <laughs> and and given this um we really have to take into account that the immediate perceptual past has a very strong influence on the on our percept in the present and some of those footprints can be deeper and even if it's not obvious how the past may influence the present it may still be possible. And it's not obvious in BEMS experiments, to be honest. I also thought about it, but it, it may be interesting to, to, to repeat BEMS experiment and record EG and look whether, whether some kind of background activity changes over time, you know what I mean? At least one should consider the perceptual history when being interested in the influence from the future to, to not, uh, confound the two. I think specifically the one study he did on accommodation yeah. to see if if people would would choose the um, choose the photo that was going to be shown the, and in the future to yeah. see if that worked. Uh, I thought that was interesting, but it does seem to fit closer to your model. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and one should consider. Uh, I mean, we all make many, many trials in order to be able to make statistics, right? And, and the, the point is, what is the time between the last trial and the present trial? And can we assume that our perceptual or men, our mental system is in a neutral state at the current trial? Or is there any trace from the last trial? in whatever way it may be influential, but it simply can be the case that there is something still there from the past. And we have to take this into account, designing our future experiments. This is my point. <laughs> oh, I think it's wonderful, you know, it, because I mean, we cannot do these studies and only have one trial. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, that's the problem. And we also can't keep our participants for hours, you know, to, to make the gaps uh, quite long. We have to find something in between. Yes, or, uh, or, or in the mix experiments, you know, <laughs> as, as we did in the second. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's wonderful, you know, bringing in, really being able to identify additional influences that we need to consider. There are so many different things that are important to consider. And I think you've demonstrated that this is one more. <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Jorgen, this has been wonderful.